Um, a few comments before we begin the presentation tonight. Um, several years ago, I saw an article in the uh, Landmark about um, the debate over a buffer zone around the uh, Wolf Road Prairie, one of the last uh, expanses of native prairie in the area. And there was an irate homeowner, as there usually is, who was interviewed uh, for the paper. And he said, and I quote, if they want to grow weeds on their property, that's their business. But he didn't want any weeds on his. Um, I was really struck uh, with the kind of unenlightened attitude of that comment. Um, a weed is a plant that grows somewhere where it's not wanted. Um, but I think attitudes are changing. And uh, this evening, our presenter, Adrian Fisher, will tell us why we should want native plants around our homes, in our parks, in our community. Um, so a little introduction of Adrian. Um, she has uh, been gardening with native plants for over 30 years. She's a board member of the Wild, uh, I always get this wrong, wow. West Cook Wild Ones, not the Wild Cook West Ones, <laughs> but West Cook Wild Ones. <laughs> wild Cook. <laughs> the Wild Ladies of West Cook. Uh, right, she educates uh, um, about and advocates for native plant gardening, natural area restoration, and biodiversity. She is also a volunteer site steward at the National Grove Forest Preserve in North Riverside. Um, so with that, Adrian. Well, thank you. Um, I just, I just want to do a sound check. Uh, I used to be an English teacher. Can you hear me in the back? OK, all right. My family usually tells me to tone it down a little. So, uh, so yeah, and um, I'm really excited to be here. This is my first live presentation since 2019. Uh, there's been some Zoom action, but it's really, really great to see an actual audience and of people that are not just heads. So it's, it's, really, it's really wonderful. So um, I think I'm going to just get right into it. You know, National Grove Forest Preserve, you all know where that is, right? It's right across Des Plaines. You take 27th and you get, go right into there. It's, the other way to get to it is off 26th Street. It's right by the river. And it's a hidden gem. Uh, and a lot of people from Riverside do, do go there. Uh, it's uh, a, what they call a best-in-class floodplain forest. Uh, its natural state is to be nice and muddy, but it's got a lot of rare tree plants, big trees. Uh, so you should, you should check it out. Um, yeah, OK. So I'm just going to practice with this a little bit. Uh, advertisement time. Uh, I am from West Cook Wild Ones, as, as he said. The, we have a yearly garden tour, uh, and it's on July 22nd. Usually we've been centered in Oak Park and River Forest because that's where most of the board members live. However, our board has expanded. We have members from Berwyn and from uh, some other communities. And we got, we've gotten to know uh, our Riverside neighbors pretty well. And we were having an event, and some Riverside people said, hey, Hey, that was, that was her. <laughs> you need to come down to Riverside. So we said, okay, okay. You know, we, we, we can't be Oak Park centric forever as much as we would love to being snooty and Oak Parkish. Um, but uh, so yeah, we came down to Riverside and we went visit a few folks in Berwyn and we were really happy. And then um, some uh, fo other folks, and I, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name, said, we have these triangles, so we're going to include some of your triangles, too, that are being planted to um, uh, uh, native plants, too. So we're really excited about it. And our gardens go from small, compact, to very large. They go from completely homeowner, uh, designed, planted, cared for, to using the help of a landscape designer. Uh, they have, have sometimes have chickens, sometimes they have edibles. Uh, it's, it's, they run the gamut, and we're, we're very excited because people uh, can be inspired by something that hopefully is close to what their own house can be like or their own yard can be like, garden can be like. So we're excited, uh, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be putting out more information. Uh, and it's, it's a nominal cost, uh, and... Uh, I, I'm, I'm, you should be proud. Riverside, you've got some, you've got some good gardens. And there's at least two of the gardens that are going to be on tours. Ours are. Yeah. And another set of gardens. Mm -hmm. Oh, Murphy, are here? No. 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 Yeah. Not, yeah. Here. Yeah. Not, not yet. <laughs> there's a few that are that, recommended, and come on out and see them. Yeah, that's, that's great. Okay, 
So um, I'm starting a video just to get us in the mood. I hope you can see this beautiful creature back in the back. That was my garden about two years ago. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through a lot of material. I'm going to start with what is a native plant? Uh, there's a lot of different ideas about what a native plant might be. It's something that was just in the United States, so you could plant it in your garden up north if you want to. Uh, it it's, might be very close by. Uh, I'm, as a site steward, I'm limited to collecting seed within a two-mile radius of my forest preserve. I can only go to other forest preserves in that little area. And we all collect seed together, and we clean it, and then we distribute it back to our little forest preserves. But I cannot buy native plants at the West Cook Wild One sale, sale and then plant them in the forest preserve. Um, you gardeners can do that. Because for gardening, native is basically northern Illinois. So I'm going to go through this a little bit. A native plant is part of the balance of nature that has developed over hundreds or thousands of years. And I'll be talking about that a little bit in a minute in a particular region. Very important. The word native should always be used with a geographic qualifier. You can't just say native. Native to what? Native to England? Native to Italy? Native to Texas? Uh, no, it is northern Illinois, where we are. That's, that's my, my, my kind of native plant. And this is an important caveat. Only plants found in this country before European settlement, 16 to 1800s, uh, are considered to be native to the United States. And that's because as soon as Europeans started coming over, they started bringing plants with them on purpose and also by accident. The common weed plantain in nat native people called white man's footprint because it appeared along, it's pretty hardy to be walked on, um, at least the ones in my yard are, and it, it appeared along paths and, some, and eventually it was meeting the European settlers as they moved west. That's how, how plants moved. And so um, right now about half the plants in Cook County uh, over 300 species, close 600 species, um, are native and about half are non-native. And most of those are innocuous. They just kind of fit themselves into little niche, ecological niches and don't do anything. There's a few that are um, thugs and bullies, like buckthorn, for example. Uh, and, but I'll be, I'm not talking, that's not my talk to give tonight. So I won't, I won't go through that. Okay, so I'm just going to take us back in history uh, as to how our little ecosystem here came to be what it is with the native plants that it has. Uh, 10,000 years ago, Illinois looked a little bit like that, northern Illinois. Uh, maybe a little before 10,000 years ago, all the way back to a million years ago, on and off. Uh, there was a wall of ice south and west of Chicago. The glaciers were a mile thick in certain places. They were grinding the, so the soil. They were flattening the land. One reason it's flat around here. Uh, eventually, they started retreating. And as they retreated, uh, this is actually going on right now up in Alaska. These are current pictures of uh, Kenei Ford, Fjord, um, they left behind a lot of rock. And if you go down to Palos, you, you, you get into the moraine area where they, they just kind of, the glaciers just kind of would stop. They'd dump some boulders and gravel and all kinds of other stuff, and then they'd move back a little bit more. Uh, and that's why that area is the way it is. Uh, and then they kind of slowly retreated north. And, and the Lake Michigan went up and down in, in uh, uh, expanse and depth and all kinds of other things happened. But basically, uh, the simple story is they started retreating and what was left back, uh, left was a lot of rock. Now, there was a boreal forest along the border, uh, like you might find up in northern Minnesota uh, at that time. But as the glaciers retreated, the climate warmed, 
vast winds began to blow. There was something called LUS, which is uh, a component of, of the greatest farmland practically in the world, except for Ukraine's that we have in the middle of Illinois, came blowing through. And when that happened, there were pioneer plants. Uh, mosses came in because they can, and lichens, because they can colonize on rock. And then little um, plants with windblown seeds came in and, and got themselves kind of nestled into the, into the mosses. And this is how the ecosystem started building. Then trees and shrubs started to migrate north, and some are pretty quick at it. Uh, and eventually, over time, over thousands of years, and don't forget there were native people here hunting, looking for places to live, moving north as hunting, good hunting, moved north with the animals and the plants. Uh, the Illinois landscape was something like this. It was a mosaic, a patchwork. It was uh, vast areas of shrub prairie, regular prairie, uh, forest, woodland, savanna, and native people were setting fires for their own convenience because if you fire up a prairie, uh, it, it leaves, it makes the grass bear, ground bare, and then it's better uh, foraging for some of their favorite game animals. Uh, and so, and in the woodland, you, if you were living in that time in that place, you would want an open woodland so you could see, see around. And I have more stories to talk about that. But uh, it, so they were setting fires, but also there were great lightning storms, lightning and thunderstorms uh, sweeping across the landscape. And so it really became, a, a vast landscape that was shaped by fire. And many of the uh, trees, bushes, forbs, grasses are all adapted to be burned. It's, it's really quite remarkable. So the historic ecosystems in northern Illinois are the woodland, the savanna, and the prairie. And this is where my story comes in. Um, the great ecologist Gerald Wilhelm was once working with the Potawatomi people, and he said, he said, so what is your word for forest? And their word for, I'm not going to try to speak Potawatomi, but his, their word for forest was something like the open area where you feel safe and comfortable. And he said, what's your word for prairie? And they said, oh, that means burned over earth, the place where it's, where it's burned. And he said, well, what's your, what's your word for forest? You know, like dark forest. And they said, that's the scary place. <laughs> um, only, you know, it sounds better in Potawatomi, but I can't. I can't say it. Um, and so that's something to think about in terms of our fire-adapted ecosystem. If you're walking through a woods and it's all cluttered with buckthorn and honeysuckle and there's just, you can't see where you're going, you know, you can't see beyond the path very far, that's, none of the historic people that lived here would have thought that that was a natural landscape they would have immediately thought that there's something wrong with this landscape, you know, uh, for all kinds of reasons. You know, who knows who's going to jump out at you from there. From there, um, It's hard to hunt your deer if, if, if it's all clogged, clogged up with, with buckthorn. So the, we've got the prairie, the vast open space, which we have very little left, which actually happens to be one of the best places to sequester carbon in the world because it's all underground. Prairie, prairie roots go down 20 feet, many of them. Uh, a third of them die every year and get regenerated. The ones that are dead are pure carbon, and they just get incorporated into the soil. Savannas, which are open areas uh, with, with fewer trees, uh, are kind of in the middle. And then woodlands are good. I mean, we all want to be restoring forests as much as we can because of climate change and biodiversity loss, but they mostly store their carbon in the, tr in the, tr in the trees, in the wood. Uh, so it's, di it's different methods of carbon sequestration, and we've got them all right here in Illinois. And, and Illinois has the potential to be doing some real good in terms of natural climate solutions. Okay, so modern times. Guess what? In a hundred and since 18, there, the Indian Exclusion Act was in, a, is, was in 1830. Chicago was incorporated as a city in 1837. Since then, 
Illinois has transformed from a place of wet prairies and wildlife to extreme fragmentation. We, of course, have climate change. We have extreme biodiversity declines. Uh, and we have soil loss because of the methods of farming. Uh, and these are just a few representative pictures. Uh, I'm not even going into the way that uh, industrial farming uh, spreads toxins through pesticides and herbicides and fungicides and all of those other things that um, have pretty much decimated uh, our, or made it very difficult for songbirds and insects and other animals to, to make any kind of living. And it's impacting the people, too, who live in those areas, Seriously, frankly. It, it really is. Um, and our beloved metro area uh, is, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> not, you know, here we are. Uh, and, but the interesting thing about Cook County is that we have the majority of the state's residents right here in Cook County. And yet, we are the most biodiverse county in Illinois. Uh, and that's partly because of our forest preserves, and it's partly because of, of the way we, of our rivers, and, and there's some other factors. So what can we do? I'm assuming everyone in this room is concerned about climate change, biodiversity loss, want to help butterflies, bees, creatures, ecosystem services, all that stuff. Well, guess, guess what? It helps. We, we, we do. We, ha we genuinely have power. Um, now, I should tell you, I think like a gardener when I'm in the woods, and I think like a restorationist when I'm gardening. Because to me, everything is connected. And I'm, all, I'm doing it all with native plants. So. All right. So this is, you know, the Home Alone kid could almost live in this house, right? Um, this is traditional, upscale. Uh, landscaping. It's got this perfect lawn with not a weed, which tells me anytime I see a lawn with no weeds, chemicals, you know, whole, whole regime there. Uh, it's got a hydrangea, not nothing but wrong with that, some, some uh, Euro European ornamental grasses, some boxwoods, um, hmm, not sure what that little tree is, maybe a crab apple. Uh, and this, this is the kind of landscaping that if you, for since the early 20th century, if you didn't have it, you aspired to it. And if you had it, you, you put a lot of money and chemicals into keeping it this way. And you'll notice that there is not one native plant in there. Uh, and that was partly a combination of people wanting to import the, the European and English way of gardening to this country because they aspired to that they imagined that that was somehow better. It was what some of their ancestors were doing, I guess. And you know, we know about English lords and their estates, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and also, the horticulture industry knew a good thing when it <laughs> saw one. <laughs> and they can, you know, com uh, combined with uh, like Scots, who invented um, uh, various kinds of herbicides that killed off broadleaf we weeds, like clover, that actually helped the lawn stay green without fertilizer. So you get rid of the clover, and then you need fertilizer. Anyway, forget that. Um, OK, so I'm, gonna, I'm from Oak Park. I don't know who lives in these fabulous houses, but they, <laughs> I walk down the street or ride down the street on my bike quite a lot. Uh, and I have some, some things to say about their landscaping. And the reason I have things to say about their landscaping is because I believe it would be the, I know that they are setting out these fabulous examples of turn of the century architecture. You know, can't fault that. However, Jens Jensen, the famous, I'm sure most of you have heard of him, the, the great, truly great native plant gardener, natural area gardener, was working at the same time. He knew Frank Lloyd Wright. And actually, he, he designed gardens for some Frank Lloyd Wright houses. And so I always look at this and think, you could do a lot better. You could do, a, the buildings would look better. They're prairie style buildings. Come on, let's, let's put on some native plants. Let's, let's put in a few framing trees. Um, one of the tenets of prairie style gardening, as Jensen and some other people 
had it, was you, you accentuate some, some horizontal lines to complement the horizontal lines of your prairie style houses. Um, and so there's a lot that could be done in, 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 in this particular situation and with this kind of nice large lawns, big yards they've got here. Now, this is a regular house in Oak Park, much more a four square. Uh, and they have had, I believe, a landscaper in. Uh, I took this picture in May last year. Uh, and this is, this is a pretty nice formal little landscape. It's, it's um, very symmetrical. It's got a couple boxwoods. It's got a couple shrubs. It's got a tree, you know, a nice little tree. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with it. You know, it's, it's very aesthetic looking. It's, a, it's nice landscaping. But my opinion, and a lot of other folks, feel that, number one, you can always tuck native plants in everywhere, even in the most traditional style of landscaping. And also, why not bring it out a little bit, you know? Why not just bring it forward? No. So with all of this, there are some new imperatives uh, to garden in a more ecologically friendly way. Uh, and Doug Tallamy is one of my heroes. I've read like all his books. I've seen him talk at least three times. Uh, and he said, in the past, we've asked one thing of our gardens, that they be pretty. Now they have to support life, sequester carbon, feed pollinators, and manage water. So you're not just putting in a garden and arranging the reds and the yellows and the blues in a certain order. And, and maybe bringing in a, an Annabelle, you know, some hydrangeas and um, mm, I don't even know. It's been so long since I've tried to do that kind of garden that I, I've almost forgotten how. Uh, but it's important. And, and uh, you know, I like this kind of more a little wilder style. And the sixth assessment report from the International Panel on Climate Change says... Maintaining the resilience of biodiversity and ecosystem services at a global scale depends on the effective and equitable conservation of approximately 30 to 50 percent of Earth's land and waters. Um, and that these are two uh, quotes are significant because Doug Tallamy has started the homegrown national park movement. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah, a few of you. And I'll be talking about that a little more. And this quote is important because we just recently, in December, had the Biodiversity uh, Conference of the Parties 15 from the UN, which didn't get nearly as much play as uh, the climate change uh, conferences of parties. But they signed a landmark agreement saying 30 to 50 percent, 30 percent of Earth should be conserved. And they made them, they, they, laid out how principles and how, how they would go about doing it. Uh, and that's, I'm going to be coming back to 30 by 30 also. Yeah, 30% of the earth by 2030. So what we're being asked for is we gardeners, there's a lot of folks saying there's, we can mark garden in this other way, this regenerative way. This is a landscape by a guy named Larry Weiner who is out on the East Coast. He's very, very well known in, in natural gardening circles. Um, and he's done a beautiful layered garden. And you can see that there's coneflowers and there's, mm, it looks like coreopsis and there's young trees. And it just, to me, that just invites you in there. And in the back, you've got the tall trees. Uh, and to me, that's like, wow, if I looked out my back window at that yard, I'd, you know, I'd want to go be there all the time. And, 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 and I can just imagine the bird species. You know, I can imagine the hawk sitting up in the tall tree and the, the robins in the mid-story and the cardinal couple kind of foraging along the path for, for, for insects. Uh, it's just really easy to, to think that those kinds of creatures would, would be there. So there's two important things to remember. How many of you are experienced with native plant gardening? Uh, yeah, a few of you. So how many of you are newbies but would really like to get into it? OK, all right, great. Um, there's two really important things. Number one, gardening with wild native plants is not the same as going to the big box store, buying five things, and plopping them, and then they just stay there forever. Okay. When you garden with native plants, you are entering a partnership. 
and they figure out where they want to be growing. I've seen it happen. Mm -hmm. I have things in different parts of my garden that I, I never planted them there, but there they are. Uh, and this is part of, and you, ha, you, you can edit your garden. You can say, ah, you know, that's, that's a little much too much agastache over here. I really should pull some of it or, you know, you, you, you can edit. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being a gardener and, and, and managing the aesthetics, but it's just a different kind of a flow and it's a different kind of a calendar. And the same thing goes, native plant gardening takes less effort, fewer inputs, less machinery, but more knowledge and skill. If you're gonna be successful as a native plant gardener, you want to learn about the plants. You wanna learn about what do they require? You know, you're, you're, not, um, you're not getting petunias to put in for the summer and then they die in the winter or impatience in its shade, or you're not just plopping some hosta around and where, it's, where it's shady. Uh, and I, I have nothing against hosta. There's some very fa fabulous hosta, but I, I I believe that there's, there's uh, the more diverse a place, the better, biodiverse. Uh, but it, takes, it does take some, some different kinds of learning uh, and, some, and a different kind of attention. Uh, there's less busyness. You're not out spraying herbicides or pesticides and you're not you're not raking all the time. You're not getting out your, bl your uh, blower all the time. You know, there's a lot of things you're not doing. But you are learning. You're, you're discovering that there's a few different species of bumblebees in your backyard. There's three more kinds of birds. There's uh, uh, just a whole different, you know, fireflies show up. It just, it's just a, a, a different kind of a, a, a way of living in your patch of, of land. Okay, so I'm gonna go into some little practical tips if you're starting out. Most, a lot of you will probably know this. These, these folks actually live like right up the block from me. I live in a part of Oak Park that has, in the south part of Oak Park that has tiny front yards. There we are. Uh, and th these people have very small front yards they are doing a form of what I call mulch gardening, which is where there's lots of mulch and a few little plants. Um, I used to call it Wisconsin style gardening because it's very prevalent up there, but then I realized I was being prejudicial against Wisconsinites, so uh, now I do this. And, and, it's, it, and, and they, even so, they have, they could put in, it's pretty shady, they could put in some native ginger, they could put in various low growing native um, plants that would look really nice and would bloom in the spring and then they'd be quiet, but their, uh, their, their leaves would still be nice. And here we are back to that house I showed you. And this is a place, uh, they've gone to a lot of trouble. I, I, I commend them, you know, they've got this beautiful little um, kind of pruned topiary in their pot, they've got some hosta, they've got everything beautifully placed, but they could put in a couple of native ground covers. They could put in some sedges. Everybody know what sedges are. They look like grass, but they're not. They have, they have wonderful virtues, which I'll talk about later. Um, they could put in spring ephemerals. That's like your, your Virginia bluebells that just come up beautifully and blue and they bloom and they're gorgeous and then they just kind of sink back into the earth until next year. And this is a pretty shady area. I can tell because they've got hostas um, and they've got a couple other shade uh, loving plants, so I, I think they could do a really good job with some win woodland na natives, and it would add to their to the look. I really believe. This is a little garden. They were in the, they were actually in the garden walk last year, and it's across the street from those other two little gardens I, or mulch gardens I showed you, um, and it's actually up the street from my house. This is lovely. Now, I, I, said, I will confess they had uh, a native plant landscaper come in and help them because they're not gardeners and they needed some water control. Uh, I don't know if any of you have trouble with flooding, uh, but a well-designed rain garden. I know, I know, the river, the river, I get it, I know, yeah. Oh, 
yeah. 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 And, but yeah. Because there used to be creeks that aren't there anymore. Right. OK. So I cannot say that as, in Oak Park, rain gardens have solved a lot of problems. I don't know if they will solve problems to the same extent in Riverside, but a well-designed large rain garden can do a lot of good. I've had people tell me that they no longer have flooding in their basements. Now, that's Oak Park. And I understand down here the, the, the river is a little more con, you know, temperamental because I, my forest preserve is a floodplain forest, right? OK, right now, I know after last night, the water is up over the banks in that river. And yeah, you're, you're smiling. Um, so what's good about this garden, and really, it's, it's not large. It's like as big as, you know, like, like, like that area. They've got sedges. Sedges manage water. Their roots go down into the soil, and they all kind of go together, and somehow magically they, they, they help water percolate and, and not flood. Um, plus, they're pretty. They have these cute little um, seed heads, and, and uh, they just look really nice. And a, and a way that a lot of people actually plant with them is they'll do a matrix of sedges. Um, Ken Williams is always on this, and Roy Diblick. You make, make a matrix of sedges, and then you plant your little flowers in between the sedges, and then it makes a really pretty design. Uh, they've got uh, a redwood tree, and, you know, some native shrubs, and it was May, so there's the Virginia bluebells. And, and then they just have a few nice big rocks just because it looks good. You'll notice they've got their leaves there, and they've got secret rain garden functionality. The way they did it was the, the uh, gutters come down under the ground, and then if, if there's a lot of rain, this thing pops up and then it floods. However, because it's a rain garden, it doesn't flood into the sidewalk or anything like that. And then it kind of sinks back down. Um, so this is in that same area with those other big Frank Lloyd Wright houses. And these people are going all out. I, I know the architect. Uh, they are putting in geothermal. They're redoing it according to you know state historic standards, etc. They are put. They've put in a. You can't see it too well. Again, this was last May. Uh, a big. It's all grasses, native grasses and sedges. Uh, and they've come along so far that they contacted Wild Ones, and next year, 2024, they want to be in the Garden Walk. Uh, they're excited. Uh, and it's really, it's really, even now, with the work not even completed, to me, that kind of fuzzy, shaggy look in, in and of itself is, is more friendly than the flat, uh, just the flat green sward. Uh, but that, you know, that's me. So, OK, we talked about finding spaces to put native plants in. Another thing that you want to do uh, is create structure. Uh, and you can do, you can have up to seven, it's like seven layers, really. Uh, and the reason you want structure is basically because plants grow better that way. Uh, you're mimicking nature to, to a certain extent. And animals like birds really need that kind of structure. They need high perches, they need uh, shrubs where they can forage for berries. Berry-bearing shrubs are really great. Uh, then you've got, you can have, if your place is big enough, you can have a, a lower tree layer. So you have tall, lower trees, shrubs. You can have vines. Um, you can have, and then the herb layer and the ground light cover layer, that's like your, your flowers and your grasses and your, and your, and your, and your, uh, your uh, sedges. Uh, and again, you can do this on different scales. If you have an estate, uh, you can do it on a grand scale. You can have a whole shrubbery. You can have a little woodland. You can have all kinds of things. If you have, but you can also do it with one tree and one shrub, and some flowers and some and some some sedges. It doesn't. There's. It's. It's very adaptable. And here's another picture. This is how adaptable it is. This. This is in Oak Park again. Uh, and they just have, I mean, that's just a little, not a big yard. It looks pretty wild. But you notice they've got like a little low kind of um, log fence here. That's a cue to care. And I know a lot of people I talk to, 
or say, oh yeah, you know, I want to have do my parkway or I want to have it in my front yard and what are my neighbors going to say and this and that. And, and it's always, you have cues to care. You make it look intentional so it doesn't look like the weeds that, that, your, that your homeowner was talking about. You, you make an edging. Um, some of the most successful parkways have a little edging and then they have uh, like flagstones through them. So it's easy to get, you can, like little curves of flagstones. So it looks like a garden. And then there's other things to think about. Maybe you put your lower plants on the parkway so that people aren't intimidated by the cup plant, which is growing 10 feet tall. Um, and, and maybe you, put, you make your bed on the, in the front lawn just a little bit more formal. Uh, but you want it to look intentional. So this looks intentional, uh, as besides being very lush, because it's got this edging. Um, and it's very clearly a tree in the middle. And over here, there's a really good um, gardening pair called Claudia West and Thomas Rayner. They have a book called Planting in a Post-Wide World, which, which kind of does, talks about the nuts and bolts of designing a landscape and what you put in first. And, uh, and, and so they had this very fine drawing of you have your ground cover layer, you have your seasonal theme plants, because remember, you're planting for three seasons, so they're showing it's summer. They have, they've got their coneflower and their liatris. And then you have your structural layer, which is the tree, or maybe it's your Joe Pye weed, your seven foot tall Joe Pye weed works as a structural plant. Uh, and so there's all, there's all kinds of ways to do it. It can be spread out, it can be compact. And again, here's a big garden. And you're not, you know, you're not making a forest preserve here. You're making a garden. And so this guy has, has beds. He's got edibles, he's got herbs, but he's also got his tall trees, he's got his shrubs, he's got his, his low, low growing herbs and you know that's a nice big yard and I think it would be a really nice place to have lunch or, or just to sit out and, and do things or to garden. Uh, so that's like the complete opposite of that little garden in Oak Park that I just showed you but it, it works in different ways. So this is the old style of gardening. We've all seen places like this. And that's what someone did in a suburb. Uh, now that might be your guy's weeds, right? It's very, it's very rambunctious. You've got wild geranium. You've got, that's a red oak there. You've got, it looks like some switch, switchgrass maybe in there. Um, but the other thing to remember is that the previous slide showed an artificial order. People say, oh, they like neat landscapes because they're orderly, they're manicured. But that's simple. And this reflects nature's true order because, the, because nature's order is, is one of complexity, it's one of biodiversity, it's one of multiple ecological niches. And, and it's one of, like a, an ecosystem is defined by the kinds of relations and relationships that all of the plants and animals and fungi and everything that lives in that ecosystem are all interwoven in all kinds of different relationships and they fill different niches. That's nature's order. And when you strip it down like that, whether it's for a, a manicured landscape or industrial farming, you are trying to go against what nature's gonna do. Uh, and, and things start to happen. Like, climate change, for example. Um, so, so this might take some time to get, get used to, and maybe it's a little too wild for some people. But every, every bit helps. So if you're doing this kind of garden, not only do you want to have layers, but you want to also be thinking about all of the other species that might use the space. Because birds don't understand property lines, bumblebees, you know, have, have a, a, a range of maybe two miles. They're just gonna go across and through and between and among. Uh, and there's all kinds of other, other creatures too. And, and if you're doing that, then again, you have to say, okay, you know, I'm gonna figure out how to do this without pesticides. I'm gonna figure out how to do this without fungicides. Um, my, my spring and fall cleaning is gonna change. Uh, I'm gonna leave the leaves. Uh, I'm gonna turn off the backyard lights at night. And this is really important. Light pollution is a scourge. It's 
people are beginning to understand that night light pollution is very bad for humans as well as animals. And if you think about the poor fireflies out in the summer at night trying to flash their lights and their would-be mates can't even find them because there's so, so many people have left their party lights on in the backyard. You know, their, their population's going to decline. And then those same fireflies, if they find each other and they mate, then their young, the larvae, live in layers of fallen leaves. And they can live there for two years. So if somebody comes in, let's say they, they, they hatch in the summer, they're, they're you know, going around doing their larvae stuff, uh, eating, other, eating beetles and predating, because they, they, they uh, eat pest bugs, actually. Uh, and then someone comes in with the leaf blower in the fall, you've just wiped out the fireflies and the overwintering butterflies and moths and all kinds of other things. But let's say you leave the leaves in the fall. Good, good, great. You're, you're, you're learning. You, you turn your lights off. You leave the leaves. But in the spring, you say, oh, my God, look at all those leaves. So you come on, you blow all the leaves out. Well, you've just wiped out the fireflies again because they would be emerging in the spring or even the second spring. And so t strategically understanding where you genuinely can just leave your leaves under your shrubs all the time is, is really helpful. Um, you'll, you'll have butterflies emerging in the spring out of those leaves. You will have, you will have a, better, a more healthy, a healthier population of fireflies. You will have robins and other birds going in among the leaves looking for bugs to eat. Uh, it's, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, and the other thing about lights is right now, or very soon, we're going to have bird migration. And Chicago land is one of the most important corridors for birds. A lot of the birds, they fly at night. Millions fly at night over, over while we're sleeping. In the daytime, they kind of stop and, and rest and recuperate and look for food. So you're helping those migrating birds by gardening the way you do. And the other way you can help them is by drawing your curtains at night, turning off lights in rooms you don't use. You don't use. Again, turning off your outdoor lights. Uh, if, you, if you have uh, lights, in the, in, say, in the alley or somewhere for security purposes, put them on a motion sensor. Uh, because birds get, they get sucked in. They get trapped by lights. And windows, um, maybe not these because they have lighting, but windows that are open that are uncurtained at night, like in, in, in uh, skyscrapers or even people's homes, the birds will bang right into them. And that's why the Chicago bird monitors uh, walk around skyscrapers in the mornings and they collect birds that have fallen, hit skyscrapers. But it's also people's homes. And it's also government buildings in, in suburban municipalities. So it's something to be aware of, you know? Um, I frequently walk through Oak Park at night because I have a dog, and after dinner we go for a walk. Uh, and I've noticed something really odd. People will have their curtains open, and they have these really nice front rooms, and there's nobody in them. <laughs> so then I think, okay, they're all in back watching TV. I mean, but they want everyone to see their beautiful rooms. Um, but it, it, during migration center season, Close the curtains or turn off the lights. Um, and it'll be better for all creatures, including we humans. Um, OK, so this is my front yard right now. I just took this picture today. Uh, the, 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 this is the trunk of a very lovely 25-year-old serviceberry tree, which is about 20 feet high, and it spreads out. Uh, and uh, I, I dearly love it, and I usually can I sort of beat the birds to the berries, but not always, because uh, the berries are so good. And in here, you can see a few little sedges, because sedges uh, come up early. And down here, you can't, you can't hardly see it, but down here are some hepatica leaves, because hepatica, the leaves stay all, all winter. Uh, and that's what leaving the leaves look like, looks like under a shrub. Now, my yard, it has, it's like a circular bed. And there's a little bit of grass around it so that it, it looks like it's intended. 
Um, and the leaves just stay there. Now, in the sp early spring, I will, in a few weeks, or in, actually probably this weekend, I, I'll come in with a stick or a rake and kind of stir things around so that the plants that are growing have a little air under there. Um, and what it does is they just gradually decay. Every year there's a new layer, and the underneath layer decays a little bit and turns, turns into soil, sequesters carbon. The de decomposers and all those uh, fungi and, and little bugs and little, little predators and stuff all, all go to town, and they, they uh, eat the carbon, they, they poop out stuff, they, they get predated. Uh, you know, it's just quite another whole ecosystem that I won't get into right now. Here you've got a little picture of what it looks like. Um, but then, that's how it looks in May, where I've got wild geraniums. I've got, this is the hepatica, magically, gets these leaves. I've got some iris reticulata, uh, native ginger, some sedges. You barely even notice the leaves. I have not raked any leaves away. And I keep, I keep harping on this and harping on it and harping on it because people kind of get stuck on it and they worry. Like, oh no, I've got all these leaves. What am I going to do? Oh, well, you know, if you plant it right, it, it'll, it'll be okay. And again, this is my backyard where I've got celandine poppy, celandine poppy, Virginia bluebells, native violets, all kinds of stuff in there. Uh, and uh, that's a pagoda dogwood, that little trunk there. So it's a shade garden. And again, that early in the spring, same thing. There's just a bunch of leaves on the ground, and you wouldn't know that all these things are going to come up and, and, and look so great. Uh, now, this is called a living mulch, because the traditional thing to do would be, instead of having all these plants underneath a pagoda dog and other, other sub, you know, small trees or shrubs, just be a layer of mulch. right? So living mulch does sort of the same purpose, but you get beauty and you get ecosystem services as well. Um, and it's also called soft landings, which is something that uh, the uh, entomologist Heather Holm uh, has, has invented with Doug Tallamy. And they call it soft landings because it's, it's softer for insects, it's softer for birds, and it, and it nurtures those kinds of life forms besides looking beautiful. So it's, that's why it's called soft landings. And then I just, uh, that's just another, another shot. And, and there again, I don't rake. I don't use leaf blowers. The leaves fall. I stir them around a little bit. Plants grow. Can't complain. That's what I mean by, some, in some ways, less work and less machines. Oh, boy, I'm going, I'm really. OK, so here is, uh, I want to show a video. Uh, this is, if I can get it going, Dan, where are you? <laughs> there it goes. Yeah, this is Bombus bimaculatus, uh, one of my favorite bees. And what's cool about, this is partridge pea. Partridge pea is an annual but it self sows and it grows where it's really hot and dry. And I just had some, so I threw it in an area where I could never get anything to grow. And sure enough, it grew. And now it grows every year because it self seeds. And what I discovered is that bumblebees love it because it offers pollen. And pollen is limiting for, for bumblebees. They need pollen. It's, it's got fat and protein in it. You know, nectar is like soda pop, and, and pollen is like you know, your, your, your good food. And it offers pollen, and it's in the morning. And so in the summer, you can sit on my back porch, and you can literally hear the buzzing of the bumblebees, because there's so many of them. And, and that was, I discovered that by accident, because I just had these seeds. And I thought, well, they're supposed to grow in dry places, so I'll just put them down there. And, that's what happened. And it's another example to me of the abundance that comes to you. Whoops, there it goes. See? Oh, well, I'll just go by. All right, so what do you choose? Well, you don't choose calorie pear, hybrid catalpa, Norway maple, weeping willow. The first two are, I've got asterisks by the ones that are actually invasive in the forest preserves. 
coming from people's houses. Um, Calorie Pear is not here yet as a, hor as a terrible thing, but it's been outlawed in 22 states, just saying. What do you get? Well, there's so many beautiful American trees. There's basswoods, there's oaks, there's hackberries, there's ironwood, there's Kentucky coffee trees, there's native maples. You know, you could just, you could go on. Um, and now we've got, um, oh God, I'm, I'm blanking on it from down south. Uh, I'll think of it in a minute. It looks like, looks like a, a pine tree, but it, uh, hmm, I'll think of it in a minute. What? No, no, no. It's, uh, damn. All right. No, bald cypress, thank you, thank you, yeah. Um, that was not native to northern Illinois, but, pe but now that with climate change, it's, it grows very well. Uh, and it's a, nice, it's a nice street tree as well. Thank you. Small native trees. Okay, forget, you know, we have American crab apples. We have American magnolias. Uh, we have all kinds of maples. What's wrong with the weeping willow? It's a non-native, uh, and it actually hy can hybridize with black willows, and it makes something called a crack willow, uh, which is, you know, I mean, there's, they're all over the place. And, uh, but they also can clog up water systems with their roots, uh, and they're very weak trees. I mean, they're beautiful. Um, they're just not exactly in the right place. Um, but these are all, you know, service berry is a very popular tree in the, in the horticultural industry to plant, and red buds are very popular. But there's other small ones like pagoda dogwoods, wafer ashes, um, that are not as well known, that are equally nice to have. And here's, I love native shrubs. So we have a long list of shrubs that, like, I've spent at least, I've been restoring, doing restoration for since the late 1990s, and about half of that I've spent cutting down honeysuckle, and the other half I've spent cutting and burning buckthorn. You know, it's, buckthorn is the is the most prevalent woody shrub in Cook County, unfortunately. Um, Eurasian viburnums, euonymus, burning bush. Uh, if you have a burning bush, that is a that is a, a bush. It, yes, they turn bright red. They are also invasive in the forest preserves. Uh, Schiller woods. If, if, um, no, that's not burning bush, that's barberry. If you go up to Schiller Woods, you will see acres of barberry under, that they're having trouble getting rid of. And it's crowded out everything else. Uh, so if you feel like, you know, like bashing bushes in your backyard, these are some good ones to get rid of. And then you can replace them with all of these wonderful, beautiful American, American shrubs that um, provide berries that are nutritious, buckthorn berries, Actually, it's buckthorn cathartica because it acts as a cathartic, and birds, it is very bad for birds to eat them, actually. But they eat them because they're there in, in, when, they, when they're looking for food. On the other hand, black currants, haze, uh, viburn, American viburnums, um, chokeberries, well, they sort of like chokeberries, elderberries. There's so many native shrubs that are not only beautiful, they make flowers, they have berries, and they benefit wildlife that... To me, that's an essential component of beauty. To me, a plant is not beautiful unless it fits in with the ecosystem and offers benefits to other creatures. Again, native herbaceous plants. Okay, forget your vinca, forget your English ivy. Uh, Lily of the Valley is amazingly invasive. Um, go for Ground covers, like again, sedges, native, go for uh, shade fl uh, spring ephemerals that look beautiful all summer with their leaves of different shapes. Go for sun lovers. And a lot of these you probably ha have in sunny gardens. Um, purple coneflower, pensamen, asters, goldenrods, all those things get, are, are uh, in, the, in people's gardens and they don't even know that they're native. And then, of course, the grasses and sedges, right? Um, if you have, like, miscanthus, you know, that big, tall stuff, uh, maiden grass, uh, that's invasive. Carl Forster feather, feather reed grass, fountain grass, all those things. Um, most well-known garden designers are now going with native grasses and native sedges. And you can see how many more species there are. No matter what your situation, dry, 
wet, sunny, shady, somewhere in between, there is a native grass and a native, uh, na native sedges that you can get. And the idea is not to make a mass of grasses. You plant your grasses in among your flowers. And they, all, they, they help hold each other up and they complement each other. So I talked about Doug Talomi. And he started the homegrown national park. He says, we have 40 acres of lawn under private control. He says, what if 20 acres of that was converted to natural native plant gardens? That would be a 20 million acre national park across the United States. And naturally, it would look different. He comes from Pennsylvania, and we come from Illinois. So that's going to be really different from what you would do in Arizona or Colorado. However, the principle is the same. So these folks did that. They took it seriously. And you can see they marked out a big island, and they, they planted a lot of native plants. And a couple of years later, they had their own little piece of the homegrown national park. And you can go to, there's, I, I forget what it is, homegrown, homegrownnationalpark.org, something like that. You can Google it. And you can put your garden on the map, and you can read about what they're doing. Um, and he points out that if, you, if neighbors do this together, pretty soon you've got a corridor. You've got a long garden. 30, America the Beautiful, uh, Joe Biden signed the initiative in, I think, 2021, saying, like 30 by 30 from the UN, we want to save 30, set aside, restore, conserve 30% of America's lands and waters. And just the other day, he set, he set aside for a national monument 500,000 500, 600, I think it was, or 506,000, yeah, 506,000 acres for Spirit um, Mountain Monument, which is great. It's in two states. It links other natural areas. There's going to be actual migration corridors for antelope and other animals. Well, we don't, we, we can't do that here in Illinois. No. So in Cook County, we've got 604,800 acres. Almost the same size, a little 100,000 less than this man, national monument he just set aside. Um, a third of that would be 201,000 200 acres. Uh, forest preserves of Cook County preserve about 11%, 69,000 acres, a little more. And they, since everybody, all of you, I'm sure, have helped vote for the referendum, they're going to be able to acquire a little bit more land and, and provide more programming. Um, so where are we going to find 132,900 acres in Cook County? Backyards. Yeah, yeah, backyards, parks, um, wherever we can find it. And you have to know that the state of Illinois as a whole, partly because of our lovely industrial farming, only 4% of the state right now is under conservation. And so we've got a long way to go. And that's, you know, that's even including the, uh, I forget how many thousand acres are in the Chusa grasslands, for example. Um, but, so we got a ways to go. So, so we gardeners, again, can advocate. We can change our gardening habits. We can join with our neighbors. We can pressure our municipalities. And we can go from that, another lovely mulch garden. That looks like kind of like my brother's yard used to look like until I kind of persuaded him uh, uh, whoops to to that uh, which I don't know where that is but I just love that picture and I have it in almost every single talk I give because you've got grass with clover you've got a bird bath you've got tall trees you've got some of our favorite favorite sun plants including that yeah sunflower a prairie sunflower out there and, and uh, false crinine and, and butterfly weed you know just it's just a Beautiful garden to me. I just think that's great, right? I, I think whoever did that just, just did a wonderful job. Oh, and that's cup plant over here. Over here, that's, you know, that, that'll grow 10 feet tall and make flowers. And I have one by my little walkway out to the alley, and I love it because I can see the bees right at eye, at, uh, eye height. So I just walk by, and there they are. And this is in Oak Park, where 
uh, someone, it doesn't look like much now, but she made her whole yard, her whole backyard, and it's, it's not a big yard, and it's hemmed in, you know, it's in between other houses, and there's an alley in the back and her garage, but she's made it into a sanctuary. And when you go in the summer, it's just a beautiful shady place, and there's birds sitting up in the tree, and um, it's just really different. And, and so many of these yards are just a flat grass and maybe a hicks yew, a yew or some sort, and a maple or something like that. And there's so much more you can do. Um, so, so I've put on a lot of online resources, uh, and uh, you can, I guess you could take a picture if you wanted to. Um, and we can post these on the OMSTED website. Yes, we can. We can post these resources. Uh, these are some of my favorite books. Um, there's Planning in a Post-Wide World. Floor of the Chicago Region weighs literally 10 pounds. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. <laughs> One of my favorite books, uh, uh, The Genius, Gerald Wilhelm and Laura Rerica are... Uh, I study that thing because you can look up any plant and then you can see what kind of plants should grow with, will be happy growing with it. Um, and uh, the New Naturalism, these are all some really, really nice books. Um, and advertisement time, if you want to buy some native plants, you can buy them from Wild Ones. And then we use, we use the money that we get to fund grants throughout Cook County for people who want to start gardens like schools, churches, little organizations. So it's strictly nonprofit. We're a volunteer organization. But we put a lot of work into this because then we are able to, to fund these other things. Um, and you can go to our, go to our website, westcook.wildones.org, uh, and we sell little, little plants, plugs. But by the next year, you can't even tell they were plugs. Uh, and they're a little cheaper, so you can buy more plants. These are all some very good nurseries. Anybody buy from Prairie Nursery, Prairie Moon Nursery? Uh, they actually have growers in Illinois. Prairie Moon is up in Minnesota, but they have growers that they contract with in Illinois. So if you're ordering from them, you can even request Illinois-grown plants, or chances are they'll send them to you anyway. Um, and we have a list of native plant landscape designers in, on our website at West Cook. They will do the whole service, you know, plan, install, maintain. They will also do plans for homeowners who would rather, you know, for whatever reason, do it themselves. So they, they offer a range of services. And if you're going to put in a, like a serious rain garden, then it's, it is probably good to have someone, a professional, help you with that. It depends on the situation. Um, and then, whoops, there I am, that's me, so. So Adrian has agreed to take some questions um, so that your questions can be heard in the recording that we're making. I will bring the microphone around to you. Um, are there any questions right now? I have one to start, unless. Uh... So I know I shouldn't have a lawn, but we do. I did not say that. <laughs> I know, I know. I, yeah. I'm exaggerating. Yeah. But um, we do, uh, I've heard that leaving leaves on a lawn will kill the lawn. So mm -hmm. we do rake those into the flower beds. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, is the process of raking the leaves off the lawn, is that uh, killing the, uh, the um, lightning bugs and other? Probably, but. but it's, you know, you have to, you have to like, assess what, what you can do. And when I, you know, I sounded pretty anti-lawn, but I have a lawn. You know, you need a place for kids to play, for the dog to roll around. Uh, mm. Doug Tallamy, again, says just use as much lawn as you need and only in places where you're going to use it. What, what a lot of us are uh, against are these five-acre spreads that are nothing but lawn. Um, and that's not an exaggeration if you go to some places and... and, and okay, thanks. Yeah. Any I questions? In the park, they mm -hmm. had a problem with 
you know, park, they had a problem. People were doing the more natural landscapes in front. They were getting in trouble with the village. Mm -hmm. People want to do it on their parkway. They were getting in trouble with village. What's the status of that currently? Okay, well, Oak Park um, passed their uh, climate, pro uh, climate action plan last year, and it has a very robust uh, biodiversity section, and I know that it does because I and others from West Cook Wild Ones kind of pushed and pr provided information and suggestions. And a lot of other people did too, but we were like meeting regularly. Um, so because of that, there's been somewhat of a change. Also, the forestry department has changed a little bit, and they are right now developing guidelines for people to, to plant on their parkways. Um, and they are actively pushing leaving the leaves because it's expensive to p pick up all those leaves and be, you know carry them off too. I mean, you know that's that's a lot of man hour, person hours, and 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 or, uh, machinery and stuff. And, and they so. freeze in the winter <laughs> on the street, <laughs> right? And they freeze on the street in the winter. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it's 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 ongoing, but but things have changed there. Um, yeah. Let me bring the microphone. Um, ahead with um, sustainability as Oak Park. I live in Berwyn. We uh, know that we would need to be changing the weed ordinance in the city of Berwyn because it's very much outdated. And I do believe that the national chapter of Wild Ones has also addressed that issue. And I know I listened to a, uh, it's probably recorded, but I listened to a webinar about uh, somebody who had a lot of trouble it was a lawyer, and she gave some really good tips about you know, what you need to know and get your act together about doing stuff about blight notices. I have a Parkway Prairie, Pocket Prairie. I haven't received a blight notice yet, but I know that other people in my town, in my city, have had it, and a lot has to do with neighbors not appreciating the aesthetics of a native garden. Thank you. Anyone else? Or did you want to comment on that? Um, well, yes, and I'm, uh, I'm very familiar with those. Uh, some people from Berwyn are on West Cook's uh, board, and uh, it's something that, that we're, we, West Cook Wild Ones, but our, you know, people in Berwyn are working very hard to change and, and plant more trees and and uh, help Berwyn evolve a little bit in terms of their, their uh, landscaping ethos. Could, could you give any advice on site preparation for putting in a native garden? Like I, if, if you're putting in, you know, grass seed, you'd like rip everything out, till all that, but I've heard that's not really the way to go with <laughs> putting in like a native plant. So what, as far as like eliminating invasive stuff that's there and main, kind of keeping the weeds down while the plants have time to grow, how do you recommend approaching that? Okay, well, there's, there's a few different ways to do it. Um, one of my favorites that I've, I've been doing this for years is the, um, the wet newspaper and, and wood chip mulch method. Some people call it lasagna mulching. Uh, and, and I know that a lot of people no longer take the newspaper, so then you, use, you can use cardboard, uh, or you can even use, I think, there used to be you could get burlap bags from coffee grinding companies. Uh, and I don't know if you can anymore, and if the burlap is, is actual burlap or synthetic. I'm not, I don't know about that. But, but anyway, the point is to put, put down the cardboard or the, or the newspaper or whatever, and then cover it with a couple of few inches of wood chips, which you can get free. I don't know, can you get free wood? Yeah, you just cover it. You, you wet down the, 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 the newspaper or the cardboard, and then you put the mulch on, and then, then you wet it down again. And you do this in the summer. And then in the next spring, you can, when you are ready to plant, you can just dig around and pop those little plants in. And then uh, there's a lot of disagreement among gardeners about wood chip mulch in terms of, oh, native plant gardens don't need mulch, you know, just don't put any wood chips down. Uh, but I found it very useful when you're, you've got these little baby plants trying to establish themselves. I don't see anything wrong with a few inches of mulch all around them so that they can 
you know, keep the weeds down and they can get a hold of, 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 of growing and maturing and turning into the plants that you want. Uh, because it really is better to plant the young plants, plugs, that are, they're probably a year old. They were, um, and uh, so they're not very big. And then you plant them and then the next year they will, they will flower for you. It's just because of the way that native, native seeds have to have a winter of stratification, and, which means being cold and damp, and then they start growing, and then it takes them a year to kind of, kind of turn into pl the plants that are ready to bloom. Uh, so yeah, so some, some mulch in the, you know, in the beginning, and then you'll find as, you, as the plants get older uh, and you, you leave the leaves, uh, that it just becomes a very, a very kind of a natural process. I, I, I used to use a lot more mulch than I use now, just because my garden is like, well, some people would say it's overgrown. But. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, in the same vein of, of neighbors, thank you. Um, I would love to do more nat uh, native in my backyard. I know I need to be conscious about it spreading into my neighbor's yard. What if that, that's not what they want? But mm -hmm. I know a lot of these native plants, like you said, mm -hmm. they're unruly. They're, they're natives. They're natural. Mm -hmm. um, is it silly for me to expect that I could keep them contained and controlled? Or are they going to spread? Oh, well, I've, oh gosh, I've never actually had that issue, really. really? Yeah, not really. Well, one of my next door neighbors was a native plant gardener, and so... She was always happy if my plants went over there. But, and so, you know, we would actually trade plants. We'd dig up plants and trade them and stuff. But, but I've, I, they wander, but, but when they wander, they start out really small. So they're easy to pull or relocate. Uh, and, and some plants, like cup plants, there are some plants that are very, very prolific. And so if you invite a cup plant or a pokeweed or certain other plants into your yard, then you are doing that knowing that you are going to be doing some maintenance. You know, if there's a baby cup plant growing where you don't want it, well, you got to pull it up or you got to dig it up, preferably as while well, it's as small as possible. Do you have any advice for um, getting rid of some invasives, like we have a whole strip of some like gooseneck stuff, and I trying to tear it up is just a nightmare. Is it just till it and then try and cover it, like you were saying, if you're going to try and convert the area? Um, or hmm, hmm, yeah. go ahead. I'm, uh, that, so I'm just wondering if you have any tips or tricks for digging up invasives, and then how long do you need to sort of le let the area sit before you try and introduce what you actually want there? Okay, that, that can go a lot of different ways. And number one, I'm going to put in another advertisement because next month in April, and I forget, the third Sunday of April, we are going to have Ken Williams, who is an expert horticulturalist, talking about weed assassins, how to control the answering though, just that question. Um, so we, and, and then we'll be posting it on our YouTube channel. Uh, and... Uh, it'll be on our website when, when it's going to be. It's the third, third Sunday in April, uh, second, uh, let's see, 2.30 in the afternoon. And it's free, so you can, you can sign up. Uh, but the short answer is, it, it, unfortunately, it depends. You know, pull what you can. Or you can try mowing it and then smothering it with cardboard and mulch. Um, it, uh, there's just different ways to do it. Sometimes, unfortunately, it, you have to get out the roundup and just kill everything. But that, that's happening less and less. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I'm a person that took, it took me five years to get rid of the gout weed. Um, I don't know if you've ever battled gout weed, but it's, it's a very, very pernicious plant. And sometimes you just pull and pull and pull. And, and uh, it just, you know, I, the goal is you're not... Not to eradicate, but to knock it back enough so that other plants can flourish. I was just out there two days ago pulling the creeping Charlie out of my, the flower beds. You know, it happens. Um, if I get it now before everything grows, it's not as much of a problem later. 
Any other, any other questions or comments? All right, well, I have a, a few announcements. Um, so uh, upcoming events with the Olmsted Society are first landscape work days. Um, well, the first one will be uh, this coming Saturday, March 25th at Harrington Park from nine to noon. Everyone is welcome, come with uh, gardening gloves and uh, we provide the tools and snacks and, and drinks. Um, the, uh, we also have the poetry contest that's open to kids uh, um, in kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, that'll be uh, in the Riverside schools. Um, we have a presentation um, here at the library on April 27th at uh, 7 p.m. Um, Charles uh, Pipel will be uh, uh, speaking on the sweep and the curve, Olmsted's Riverside. So not only the history of uh, the design of uh, Riverside, but also Riverside is a model of sustainability. Um, we have the vintage baseball game coming up uh, Saturday, May 20th at the Big Ballpark. Um, that'll be at 1 p.m. That's the uh, hometown favorites, the uh, Chicago Salmon against the Blue Island Brewmasters. Um, I was also going to mention that uh, you talked about the biodiversity of the Chicago area. We have on our website um, a presentation by Spencer Courtright. He was our um, 2022 annual meeting presenter. And he, uh, the title of his talk was The Gem of Chicago Wilderness, the Most Ecological Diverse Area in the U.S. So if you want to learn more about the diversity of the Chicago, biodiversity of the Chicago area, they, I recommend that um, video. Um, so last of all, thank you to Adrian. Thank you. Yeah. I, I just want to thank you all for listening okay. and right. asking good questions and just, just being here after these years of, of uh, pandemic. It's, right. it's great to see you all. Well, thank you. I also wanted to thank uh, Brent Bowles and the Riverside Library, Riverside TV. A recording of this presentation will be available on the Riverside TV website and the Olmsted Society website. And thank you all for coming tonight. Have a good night. <laughs>